Before we start, if you're enjoying these conversations, please make sure that you like or subscribe to Cleaning Up. It really helps other people to find us. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation. Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich and this is Cleaning Up. My guest today is Roger Pelkey Jr. He's a professor of science and policy at the University of Colorado Boulder. Now, this is going to be a longer than usual episode, so we're going to be creating a natural break halfway through. It's going to be a fascinating and controversial conversation, so let's get started. So, Roger, welcome. Thank you for coming on Cleaning Up. Thanks, Michael. Great to be here. Now, you are on a sabbatical, so where are you calling in from? Yeah, sabbaticals just started, thankfully. I'm, I'm, I'm in Boulder, Colorado. I just finished our semester, and I'll be headed to Europe uh, come August uh, for a while. Okay, very good. Um, that must be, uh, you must have been looking forward to it because you do so many things. You're working on so many different fronts uh, at the university. Do you want to just take us through uh, the subjects you've been uh, diving into and you've been covering? Yeah, I mean, when people ask what I do, I mean, I, I do one thing. I, I study policy questions at the intersection of science and politics. Um, usually sticky ones, difficult ones, politicized ones. Um, I've had a, a great opportunity in my career to work on topics as varied as, as space policy, um, sports governance, energy policy, climate policy, natural disasters, uh, the pandemic response. Uh, it, it, it's a growth area for, for conflict where science and politics meet. So uh, I'm lucky to be in that space. Well, so today we're mainly going to be talking about climate and climate policy. So that's not one of the politicized ones. So this should be, you know, a relatively smooth sailing. We can knock this out in a short, little short bit. Yeah. Now, I want to take as the starting uh, point, as the kicking off point, uh, the presentation by Stuart Kirk, HSBC's um, head of responsible investing. Now um, he's been suspended because of remarks that he made at the FT Moral Money Conference uh, a couple of weeks ago, and um, and you wrote a blog post about some of the things that he said, and I think we'll probably get into some of the things that he didn't uh, say. So why don't we start by, just for those who've not watched it, maybe they've read an article, but that's not good enough around here. What did he actually say? So this was a presentation that was entitled, Why Investors Need Not Worry About Climate Risk. And uh, he started by saying, I take a very, very financial and investment view of the topic, which, of course, those of us who are in finance and investment found a little uh, difficult to stomach because some of the finance that he was talking about, some of the way he was regarding credit risk and so on, were actually deeply non-financial. Um, but um, do you, you know, do you want to talk us through some of the things that he said that maybe uh, resonated? Because there was a, there was a lot to it. There was a whole bunch of slides, and he had data. What was the, what was the overarching thesis in your view? Yeah, the overarching thesis was, was um, that in, investors really don't need to worry about climate risk. It, it's not something that should be a high priority. Um, and he had a number of, I think, interesting and valid points there that were mishmashed with some others and maybe some flippancy that subtracted from the, his ability to communicate his message. Um, and overall, it was perceived, you know, he said something kind of smart alecky, who cares if Miami's under six meters of water. You know, Amsterdam's a nice place and it's below sea level, um, which I think obscured some of his more uh, technical, you know, more important points that I think any ESG investor should be aware of and, and should talk about. Right. And so he was talking about, you know, the Miami point is, you know, shorthand, flippant and offensive. And in fact, his tone was fairly offensive throughout, but it's, it's shorthand for we're going to adapt. Humans are adaptable and we're going to adapt. And, um, and then he said some other things about how the term of a loan, the average HSBC debt portfolio debt loan uh, is six years. And so he, he said at one point, um, what happens to the planet in year seven is actually irrelevant to our loan book. And that's where I would take issue with his finance, because that's not actually the way it works. Um, and he also talked about how much wealthier the world would be, right? Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's interesting. I've done a lot of work um, with reinsurance companies and, and reinsurance contracts are priced annually. And so, you know, when you're, when you're pricing a reinsurance contract, you want to know what your risk is for the next year. And so I get it from a mathematical, from a, a you know, spreadsheet perspective that if your, your 
ensuring your risk for the next year, then what happens in year 30 you know, probably doesn't factor into that. I get that point. But at the same time, as you know, corporations are citizens of the planet um, and saying that there's no concern beyond the bottom line you know, into the long-term future, I get it, it just subtracted from his, his long-term um, perspective that he was raising. When he talked about um, GDP, he raised a really important point that I don't think is widely appreciated um, in the broader community. And that is that under the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, IPCC, its scenarios um, have some contradictions in the long term. On the one hand, all of the scenarios show that every one of us worldwide in differing amounts, but we will all be much richer by 2100. Um, at the same time, it says uh, that in some regions, people won't be able to live there. It'll be uninhabitable um, if, if temperatures rise at the extreme levels that they, they talk about. So, so I call this the climate GDP paradox, and um, Kirk, you know, picked up on it, but I don't think he fully appreciated that um, this is an inconsistency. This isn't a reality. It's not a prediction, and uh, it would be appropriate for ESG investors and their advisors to to ask us experts to get our story straight. You know, which is it going to be? Are we all going to be richer, or we're not going to be able to to live in certain places? So there is a paradox inherent in the scenarios that we can unpack quite a bit. But again, that was missed in the the tone and the delivery of the presentation. Right, and I've come at that paradox in the past from an energy systems perspective, which is, you know, if you look at some of these scenarios, they involve, um, you know, very extreme outcomes, very extreme sea level rise, and yet the coal-fired power stations keep powering away and chucking out more and more CO2, even though technically, technically many of them are actually underwater. And I raised this with Nico Bauer on a podcast uh, actually an energy transition podcast. And he got quite irritated with me and said that I was sort of, that this was irrelevant and it was, and why was I, you know, why was I bringing up things? And that's not what the models are intended to do. But for me, uh, there is a plausibility requirement around these scenarios. And there is the GDP paradox. And there's also kind of an, a physical infrastructure energy systems paradox too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're exactly right. And this, this gets to one of the tensions. And I know you've talked a lot about it on the show. But scenarios um, at one level are, are just scenarios. They're just, they're just things that we make up to explore different plausible futures. Um, but in the, in the you know, game of telephone between the scenario inventors, the IPCC, the media, and then policymakers, they become more like forecasts or predictions or, or anticipations of what the future will be. And, and separating those things out, one as a tool to help us explore possibilities versus thinking of scenarios as crystal balls somehow, um, it, it, it gets really, really complicated, I think, for people to understand the difference there. Right, I just wanna come back to this point about credit risk, because I think that's also, for me, that's at the heart of why this is not a financially robust position that he's taken. Uh, and I do have sympathy with some of these points that, you, that, that he's made and that we're gonna talk about more. Yep. But on the credit risk, if you lend to somebody for six years, and then uh, the idea is that that person will repay and refinance that loan. If they know and you know and everybody knows that in year seven or in year whatever, uh, something bad is going to happen to that person or to the asset in question so that it becomes unrefinanceable, you may not see your principal back. So it absolutely what can happen outside the term of your loan can impact the credit worthiness and the value of your debt book, which is, you know, if you're in the investment game, you're taking a very, very financial and investor view, you should kind of be aware of that. Um, but what was really fascinating was also the response of the kind of, you know, the, the, the climate great and good to this, you know, rather flippant and offensive, but actually in some ways, very interesting presentation. So what were the ones that stood up of the responses? What stood out for you? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, 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 Christiana Figueres, one of the um, former heads of the Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, you know, put out a tweet um, and, you know, basically just dismissing the entire presentation. Um, his own boss uh, at HSBC came out and says, I distance myself from these views. Um, and you know, in the media, of course, there was everything from calling him a climate denier to um, a troll to, you know, the, the usual sort of reaction that we get on um, when people raise issues about climate change. And this is where I think Kirk did himself a disservice. He, if, if he was trying to make nuanced points, um, which are perfectly valid, he did it in such a non-nuanced way 
that it, it lent itself to being interpreted in a non-nuanced way. Um, and in climate change, as we all know, there's there's good guys and bad guys. And he allowed himself to be painted as as one of the bad guys. Right. And, you know, just to go back to the you know, Christiana Figueres, who's a very good friend, and she was actually on this show. She was on episode uh, episode six. Um, but in her tweet, she didn't just say this is unacceptable. This is really, you know, or this is a, a pile of garbage. What she actually said was fire Stuart Kirk and come out with a responsible position on climate change. It's the fire Stuart Kirk bit that, I mean, that's kind of why I've used this perhaps as a yeah, starting yeah. off point for the conversation uh, with you, because you've been on the receiving end of this kind of demonization calls to be to be excluded from conversations. And so that's why I think it's, it's uh, it, you know, I was wondering whether that one would resonate. In fact, you wrote in, in your blog in response, you said you have some sympathy for him. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do have some and I don't have some. I mean, um, we all know that that discussion and debate over climate change is very censorious and, and you know, the, the, the very quickly people go after people's employers and they want you to be fired and so on. Um, at the same time, Kirk is the head of responsible investing for a major bank. And he was at an investor conference where, um, you know, typically, <laughs> almost always, people do not present themselves as brave truth tellers under undermining their own industry. So, so I get it if there was some outrage from his employer. Um, you know, I'm a tenured full professor. And so, you know, I'm pretty secure in my position. So I can, I can gain and lose writing gigs left and right. Um, but that's not going to change how I, I approach my, my business. And so I think it's different in different situations. But there is this overall tendency. And I know I have junior colleagues who are afraid to say certain things um, where there is an online mob, for lack of a better word, that will, you know, turn on people if they are perceived to be out of line. That's, it's not, you know, I know obviously not unique to climate change. It is a, uh, you know, a sign of the times that we're in on for a discussion of any difficult issue. Right. And that brings us to kind of the two big themes of this conversation. You know, on the one hand, um, you know, why did I invite you to have this conversation? Because I think we can do a powerful job educating, you know, some of the audience about what is and isn't happening with climate change. And, and you're, you know, uh, you're across the detail, I'm across some different details, there'll be a good yeah. conversation. But there's also this subtext about who is allowed to pursue that discussion and who is not allowed to pursue that discussion. Um, so, you know, let, let's kick off. I think that um, I've seen you do this quite often because you have been called all these names and, and, and so on because of some of your interventions. Do you wanna just start by laying out what is your position on climate change? I mean, are you, I, I'm actually, you know what, I'm not even gonna use the word denier, I never use it because I think it's just, a, it is absolutely part of that phenomenon of excluding people. So, but what is your position on climate change? Yeah, and my position on climate change has been, uh, you know, looking back remarkably consistent for, geez, almost the 30 years I've been writing on it. Um, I was the, the, I think, the first person in the United States to write a PhD dissertation on the role of climate science in supporting climate policy. Um, I had the advantage of growing up in a household where my, my father is a famous atmospheric scientist. Um, so I knew about the greenhouse effect by the time I was you know, in junior high school in the 1980s. Um, climate change is real, it's serious. Um, car uh, carbon dioxide emissions from the burning of fossil fuels is a, if not the me major driver in uh, climate change. Um, what I'm saying is boilerplate IPCC conclusions. Um, I have uh, strongly supported IPCC since, you know, it, since the beginning, um, and I have, uh, you know, one one difference for me is I came to the climate issue as a scholar first through studying adaptation uh, based on my work at, at National Center for Atmospheric Research in the 1990s, and later I came to energy policy and mitigation. Uh, so in that sense, my my career is kind of backwards around compared to how the issue has has evolved over time. Um, but um, I think if people take a look at my writings. If they actually take a look at my writings, that's the, the key there. Um, I'm pretty, uh, you know, plain consensus science sort of a person. Um, have I uh, published things that some people haven't liked? Sure, um, that's normal. Um, have I taken issue with IPCC sometimes? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm an expert. That's my prerogative. So um, I don't, um, over the years when people call me names and try to put me in a bin I don't belong, um, I've always viewed that as um, a sign that you know they can't find anything wrong or sufficiently wrong in my analysis to impeach that, so they go after the person. Um, it used to bother me a lot more, 
but um, I think, you know, over time, my work has stood the test of time. And, um, you know, it's not just me out there that's getting called names anymore. It's, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who've been put in the, the category with me that, uh, you know, also like me, don't belong there. Okay, so, and just to be very, very clear then, so climate is changing. Absolutely. And you've said that humans are a, if not the major contributor, I mean, again, that's not quite orthodoxy these days, which is that it is humans. I mean, are you are you fully orthodox or somewhat orthodox on that? <laughs> I am fully orthodox in the sense that I support the IPCC conclusion. I mean, here's 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 one important detail that people don't generally appreciate. Uh, the framework convention on climate change defines climate change only as those changes caused by the uh, emission of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Um, IPCC has a much broader definition and refers to climate change as referring to any source of change. Um, and it's, you know, we've learned over time, and again, this is orthodox IPCC, that things like aerosols, um, uh, green, uh, land use changes, work that my father has done, for example, and so on, and that there are broader Im human impacts on the climate system than just greenhouse gases. So uh, I think it's really important to recognize that, that orthodoxy is not the linear effect of one atmospheric constituent. It is complicated, and that's what the IPCC says. And one of the challenges I've had over the years, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, is that sometimes uh, simply saying plain vanilla IPCC statements um, gets turned around and called climate denial. Uh, we see this on extreme events and so on. So um, the, the physical science of climate change, uh, the role of carbon dioxide, role of wind, that's outside my expertise. I'm like you, I'm like most everybody else. I defer to the expert community, which is the IPCC. So if people say, well, what's your view in detail on climate change? I say, have a look at working group one, because there's, you know, it's not my, my job to, uh, to, to challenge or impeach that community. Okay, and then what about on uh, mitigation? Because you wrote a book in 2011 um, called uh, Climate Fix. What were you saying in that book and how might it have changed since then? Yeah, so that book, I mean, that was a fun book to write um, that was, um, it was based on uh, the Kaya identity, which I know you've explored in detail on this show. Uh, the title, The Climate Fix, was kind of a, a, you know, maybe too clever, but a play on words, because a fix can be a problem, a fix can be a solution, a fix can be a sticky situation you can't get out of. Okay. Let, let me ask you the Kaya identity, because although aspects of it have certainly been covered, we've never talked yeah. about it as such, and, it, and it's a great one, but I think I, I have this kind of um, acronym klaxon, but I'm also going to have a kind of, you know, um, uh, complicated name klaxon that says, yeah. you know, you, you need to say, what is the Kaya identity? So the Kaya identity, and it's the basis for my book, The Climate Fix, um, it, is, it is the single most powerful tool that we have for understanding the challenge of emissions reductions. And it was, it was developed in the 1980s by a Japanese scientist called Yoichi Kaya. Um, and the point was to generate profiles of future carbon dioxide emissions so they could be plugged back in to climate models. And it says there's four reasons uh, why we have increasing carbon dioxide emissions. More people, more wealth, uh, energy consumption, and energy production. That's it. Um, there's, nothing, there's nothing outside of that. And so the Kaya identity really allows us not only to create scenarios, but to work backwards from scenarios and say, well, what would it take if we wanted to get to net zero carbon dioxide or we wanted to reduce emissions by 50% by 2030? Um, and it's, it's, it's so simple with four factors um, that the mathematics are really easy for anyone to understand. Right. And the way it's come you know, into these shows <laughs> is, for instance, it's, as you say, it's population times wealth per capita. Well, so we don't talk about population. I'm very, I like people. Uh, if somebody wants to go and have a show about how we should reduce population, that's not going to be my show. Then you've right. got wealth per capita. And, you know, we can have a discussion about what that means. How do you measure wealth? But I want more wealth, more human potential, more cultural activity, better health care and so on. And certainly in the developing world, we've talked a lot on these shows about how we've got to, you know, uh, we've got to support people in developing their uh, uh, capacities. Uh, and then you've got energy use per unit wealth. And that's a lot of the stuff around energy efficiency, energy productivity, technically. And then, of course, the last one, which is carbon per unit energy, which we talk about a lot on these shows. So the Kaya identity, right. for those not familiar with it, it is a fantastic jumping off point. Now, did you 
in the climate fix, did you look at some of the solutions, renewable energy or whatever, for those different pieces of the formula? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So in the climate fix, what I did is, I, you know, I took issue, and this was, you know, a, a while ago now, but I took issue with the way that we use scenarios, scenarios of the distant future, where we can put in all sorts of assumptions and make emissions look like they're going up, make their look like they're going down. But, but really the challenge of emissions reduction starts today. Um, we have a, a vast infrastructure, which we consume an enormous amount of energy worldwide, 80 to 85% of it is fossil fuels. And I simply said, all right, let's take the Kaya identity. The first thing to understand is we're not going to get rid of people um, like Logan's run for people of a particular generation. Um, we're not going to make people poorer. It's just not going to work. We all know about the yellow vests in France and how governments right now are propping up um, you know, fuel price subsidies. Um, so GDP is off the table. And what that means is we have only two instruments that we can use to, um, to achieve deep decarbonization. And one is um, energy productivity, as you mentioned, um, often you know, reduced just to energy efficiency. And the other is the carbon intensity of the energy that we produce. Now, I won't go through it, but if you get into the math, whatever we do on efficiency, and efficiency is important, not least because it helped us become wealthier, but whatever we do on efficiency, carbon intensity worldwide has to go down to close to zero. That means we need to replace existing fossil fuel infrastructure with, with non-carbon infrastructure. And at that point, it becomes a math problem. And we can figure out how much kit has to be replaced over what time period, while at the same time, recognizing that global energy consumption is going to increase. Um, but again, irrespective of what we do in wealthy countries, because there's a lot of places around the world that lack, where people lack energy access. So on the climate fix, I walked through this exercise um, and it simply presented the magnitude of the challenge. Um, and the, the first step in solving a problem is understanding right. the magnitude. Now, so far, it's sounding very, very, in a sense, mainstream amongst those people who are, you know, who've, who've woken up to the climate challenge and to the energy centrality and the sorts of things we're going to need to do. It sounds very conventional now. But you've got into a situation where people have called you, um, they've called you, an what is it, a, an irresponsible skeptic. We'll talk about who in a second. They've called you deniers, you've already said. Um, you've, been, you've been told that you're outside the mainstream of science. When you know you've said that all you're doing is representing what's in the IPCC, and then you know uh, writing about how we might fix it. So it's sort of I think we have to start now by talking about hurricanes, because um, that kind of was your portal into some uh, some some uh, into this kind of world of of being um, you know othered from within a lot of the climate discourse. So let's start with when did you start working on hurricanes? How long have you been working? Are you just you know somebody who's dipped in a little bit, or have you done a lot of work? And uh, and then what did you find? Yeah, so I I, it, I started working on hurricanes in my postdoc, which I started in 1994, uh, working for a guy named Mickey Glantz. Um, at, and he was the founder of Climate Impacts Research at uh, the, the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, and I was hired to do a detailed study, not of climate change, but of policy responses to Hurricane Andrew, in South Florida. And then the 1993 uh, Great Midwest U.S. floods. Um, that postdoc became a staff scientist position at NCAR. Um, and at some point, um, Mickey came in. Uh, came in one day with a, a Newsweek magazine. There used to be magazines. They used to be made out of paper. And he handed it to me. I had on the cover uh, uh, floods, hurricanes, and blizzards blame global warming. And, and again, this is early days in the you know climate and extreme event. Uh, controversies he, and he put it on my desk and he says why don't you why don't you look at this and so that kicked off what has been you know 25 plus years of studying hurricanes um and you know the first big paper we did was 1998 uh with a scientist named chris lancy um great name for a hurricane researcher lancy um he's now uh, one of the top people at the national hurricane center um, but we started with a paradox the paradox was 1991 through 1994 was the most expensive period for hurricane impacts in history. It was also the quietest period for Atlantic hurricane activity in the last 50 years. And we said, how can it be the most expensive and the quietest? And that led us, um, many discuss discussions on basketball courts and over beers, um, but that led us to a paper where we said, well, let's, let's, ask, let's answer a question. 
if every hurricane season of the past happened with 1995 population, 1995 infrastructure, how much damage would there be? And we call that normalized hurricane damage. Um, and that kicked off, we've done a, you know, a series of papers on that, widely cited, um, unfortunately largely ignored by the IPCC, um, which has been enormously influential in insurance and reinsurance and in finance, uh, because we were uh, among the first people to offer an alternative to, to catastrophe models for understanding trends and damage. Uh, and so, you know, I don't know how many papers I and colleagues have done on hurricanes, but it's, you know, it's in the dozens, they're widely cited. Um, I'm pretty proud of that, that kind of thread of my research career. In preparation for this, I had a look at a couple of those papers. I didn't go all the way back to 1998, but I found 2005. And um, to quote from it, the paper concludes that with no trend identified in various metrics of hurricane damage over the 20th century, it is reasonable to conclude that the significance of any connection of human caused climate change to hurricane impacts necessarily has been and will continue to be exceedingly small. Um, 2012, you essentially repeated, I think, the similar sort of analysis and said evidence in this study provides strong support for the conclusion that increasing damage around the world during the past several decades can be explained entirely by increasing wealth in locations prone to tropical cyclone landfalls. And then you've just written a blog piece just, I think, a few weeks ago. Um, and broadly, it's the same story. You're finding the same story, that the damage by hurricanes is caused by what we put in their way by our wealth and, and where, we, where, where uh, assets and infrastructure and real estate is, and not by the physical science of hurricanes. Is that a correct interpretation of your sort of- Yeah, that's, I mean, that's perfectly fair. And, and again, let me say, th this, is, um, this is fully accepted by IPCC. This is, this is not, you know, Anyone who, who understands kind of development and the history of how um, coastal wealth has accumulated, um, it, it's not going to be anything more than common sense to understand that, that the driver of increasing losses um, happens to be wealth. Um, there's no surprise there. Um, I often tell people like, if you wanna look for signals of climate change in hurricanes, don't look at economic data, look at hurricane data, look at actual climate data. Um, one, one data point that gets me into trouble a lot, and then again, it's straight out of the IPCC, straight out of the World Meteorological Organization, straight out of NOAA here in the United States, the, the official agency that keeps the data set. From 1990 to today, there is no upward trend in landfalling hurricanes or landfalling major hurricanes. So is, is there is no- the, Sorry, Roger, is that just in the US or is that globally? So, so let's just start with you. That's the U.S. Globally, we did the first study um, in 2013 um, with Ryan Maui and Jessica Winkle, where we looked globally at hurricanes over the time of record, which goes back to 1970. Um, in the Western North Pacific, we can go back to the 40s. In the North Atlantic, we can go back to 1900. But globally, we have data from 1970. And again, there's no upward trend over that time of hurricanes. Um, that has been, we updated that data set for the World Meteorological Organization um, very recently. Um, when I tell people there hasn't been an increase in hurricanes, um, I get funny looks and people ask questions. And part of the issue is, I think, if you just started paying attention to hurricanes in the last 20 years, um, which is a lot of people a lot younger than me, um, you would think there's a lot more hurricanes. The most notable feature of the US hurricane record is an 11 year period from 2006 to, to 2017, where there were no major hurricane landfalls onto the continental United States. So of course, if you're 40 years old and you've just come to the climate issue in the last 20 years, you might think, I don't remember hurricanes when I was in college. And of course you'd be right. Um, that's why we can't substitute our experience for actual climate data. Um, so the over, and I think, I think we're past the controversy on this, except maybe on, you know, on Twitter. But most people now accept the fact that, that the, the main driver of economic losses, not just for hurricanes, but for disasters generally, is what we build, where we build, how we build it, and then what we put inside of it um, in terms of wealth. Right, and just one question, and I wanna come back to this question about, um, about uh, not just hurricanes, but broaden it to other sorts of um, disasters, weather, climate-related disasters. Yep. Just in terms of the data, 
you said that you've you've mentioned a number of times, you know, you look at the data, we built the data, we built the database, we updated the database. You've got this, you know, your work over that 30 year period, you've been building databases, contributing to database. What is the definitive database for this stuff? Yeah, so the, so the, the World Meteorological Organization, which is an, you know, an instrument of, of multilateralism in the United Nations system, um, has done heroic work in taking data that um, hurricanes occur in different ocean basins around the world and different national and regional meteorological organizations have responsibility for collecting that data. And as you might guess, they collect it maybe a little bit differently. They use different, uh, different criteria for putting storms in categories. So they've done heroic work in creating a harmonized global data set that we can use for these sorts of purposes. So that is the physical science data. Um, the economic data that we use for the United States comes from, um, from a data set kept by the National Weather Service. And then internationally, um, Munich reinsurance and Swiss reinsurance um, have the most authoritative records, which really, unfortunately, only go back reliably to about 2000. Okay, but the, but the point I'm sort of, you know, fishing for is, um, is there anybody out there, are you using your own data? Are you using your own facts? Is there anybody else with different facts, different data? Um, because, you know, it has become, as you say, it, it is controversial. If I, you know, if I point to your work, and I've done this on, on Twitter, you get just so many people that pile in and say, this is, this is, this is wrong, and, and, and they sort of act like it's your own private data set. Is that right? No, it's not right. Um, um, there, there, I mean, maybe on Twitter, but in the scientific community, there's, there's essentially no controversy on historical landfalls in the different basins. Um, there, there are different ways to interpret things like the translation speed of hurricanes or poleward movement, where you know we have satellite records, right. we have ship records, and so on. But you know, for damage, it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's the intensity of storms at landfall that is the most important variable. And everyone pretty much uses the same data for that purpose. Okay, so let's broaden to these, you know, other types of, you know, climate slash weather related damages. So we're talking droughts, we're talking wildfires, uh, we're talking flooding, um, we're talking heat waves. Right now, what is your position on, uh, in any of those areas, are we seeing a climate fingerprint? Are any of the things, when you see these stories, the, we've just had this fearsome heat wave in India and the attribution science, which is what they now call what you started to do 30 years ago with hurricanes, they would say it's made, that climate change has made that 30 times more likely. You look at the wildfires in California or in Australia, and you know, there's some, you know, certainly the consensus that I read uh, is that this is, you know, climate change has made that more likely. And the same with the floods in, at the moment, Australia uh, and these other things. So according to you, is any of that real? So, so the first thing to, to say, and we'll, we'll, I'll get you to that, is um, we can't talk about extreme weather as a big category. Extreme weather involves phenomena, and we have to take them phenomena by phenomena. Um, the IPCC Working Group 1, sixth assessment report, which came out last fall, chapter 11, goes through each of these phenomena and comes up with a statement of what is known and what's not known and the degree of consensus. And so there are a few items for which, um, oh, and the second thing to say is the way the, the IPCC has worked historically is it defines a change in climate is a statistically detectable change over 30 years or more of data. And attribution refers to, well, if we find a change, can we then, put some causality on greenhouse gas emissions. So there's detection first, then attribution. Um, the IPCC concluded that with respect to heat waves um, in, in many parts of the world, interestingly though, not North America, but in many parts of the world, um, they have detected a an, an statistically significant increase in heat waves. So yes, it is absolutely the IPCC's position that we've seen that, and that increase can be attributed to greenhouse gas forcing. So that's perfectly reasonable conclusion. A second area where the IPCC has some confidence that they have detected a signal of human-caused climate change is in what's called extreme precipitation. Um, people have to be real careful. Extreme precipitation is, is um, it's a colloquial term, but it's also a scientific term. And um, the IPCC goes to great lengths to say 
don't confuse extreme precipitation with flooding. So here I am, summer, Boulder, Colorado. If we get five centimeters of rain today, that's an extreme precipitation day. Will it cause flooding? No, it won't. Um, so, but again, extreme precipitation is another area where they have uh, detected and attributed. Now, when we get to other phenomena, floods worldwide, uh, meteorological and hydrological drought, tornadoes, um, there is uh, no attribution to be sure, and very little, uh, very little detection. Um, in some regions, things go up, some regions they go down. Now, there is an important area where there has been a detected trend that has been attributed in some parts of the world, and that's what's called fire weather. The IPCC does not weigh in on wildfires or forest fires per se, because they are multi-causal due to you know, forest management and things like that. But what they do focus on is what's called fire weather, which is a combination of hot and dry conditions. And they have found an increase in fire weather in a number of places around the world. Um, so with respect to extreme events, there, there is a, you know, there's something there for everyone, but it's really important to understand that with respect to tropical cyclones, which includes hurricanes, flooding, meteorological and hydrological drought, and tornadoes, the events that we see in the media the most, um, the IPCC does not have confidence in either detection or attribution. Um, that's just what the data says, you know, and I, I know it's not, you know, it's not popular <laughs> To, to say that, but this has been a consistent finding of the IPCC for many years. Okay, and so there is something there, what you're saying, if I'm glossing this back to you to make sure that we're very clear mm -hmm. and the audience can, can keep up and I can keep up, yep. you're saying that in a number of areas, there are things that are going on that are both, um, they can be detected and they can be attributed and we can be pretty sure, and they are harming people. There are real harms. So if somebody said to you, climate change damage is happening now, you could agree with that statement. It's, it's, so when you jump from the physical event to the damage, things become a lot more complicated, right? Because damage requires the intersection of, of, of an exposed and vulnerable society on the one hand and an extreme event on the other hand, right? So, so if your position is that yes, heat waves have led to you know, greater heat, heat exposure, um, then certainly that's the case. Um, all else being equal, right? Um, you know, there's, there's, there's more um, human impact from heat waves that occur in the Pacific Northwest than in right. Phoenix, say. But if right? we take very vulnerable people, you take the Horn of Africa, the East mm -hmm. Africa, right now, you know, there, there, is, a, there is a drought, there is, uh, I, I'm, I don't know what the temperatures are doing there, but there's definitely a drought. And there are certainly those who are saying this is climate change and certainly um you know a lot of the livestock has died yeah, yeah. and the people are really suffering are, are you are you you know do, do you sort of do you look at is that one of the ones where you say okay this passes all the tests detection attribution and vulnerability so therefore yeah that's probably you know a, a climate damage or are you so, are you un, unable to unwilling or unable to do that well, so let, let's make this clear. You, you raise a really important point. So, so we went from talking about 30 year plus trends in events to raising say a particular drought in the Horn of uh, North Africa. So there is a, a relatively new area of science that has developed that's called event attribution. And the way, so there's a few things to say about that. The way that that is done is you take a climate model, a physical climate model, and you say, well, how would the world have developed if we never emitted any greenhouse gas emissions? All right, so you plug that in your model, you come out with some results. You, you run it a second time and you say, all right, we're gonna put greenhouse gas emissions in carbon dioxide this time and see how the world would uh, evolve. And so you have two model realizations. And then what is done is, is they're compared and they say, well, what would the risk be of this event, this type of drought in the greenhouse gas version versus not the greenhouse gas version? Um, that's called event attribution. Um, the IPCC has acknowledged it, but has been pretty, um, I don't know, subdued on promoting it because again, it's early days um, in that sort of science. Um, there are a number of challenges. We have a lot of climate models, right? Because you can get one model and get a realization that says something. Um, 
all right, that's interesting. It, it helps with hypothesis generation, but it's certainly not, not certainty. Um, another issue is what do you do if the IPCC does not detect trends in drought overall over 30 years, but this one drought illustrates a higher risk. There's, there's, a, there's a logical conundrum there. Um, so, so there is a lot of caution on the event attribution. I guess the last thing I'll say is that the people who have developed that, are, you know, all good, thoughtful scientists, but, but the motivation that they have expressed is, number one, they want to help get these stories in the media, and number two, they want to underpin lawsuits for responsibility for greenhouse gas emissions. For me, all of that says um, I'm not quite ready to abandon the IPCC's conventional framework for detection and attribution. Um, these are interesting, provocative studies. They certainly generate headlines, um, but I'm not sure that they have the, the stature of 30-year, you know, 40-year, 80-year 80 data sets looking at drought, floods, tropical cyclones, and so on. I'm not ready to substitute models for, for, for evidence quite yet. Right. And the, you used an ex, I used an example and you followed up uh, the droughts in Africa, but that would presumably also go for the heat wave in India and Pakistan. We're just now reading that it was 30 times more likely, but that's in this model run against that model run, not based on the fact that the last few years have seen 30 times more of those events than the previous 30 years or the- or Yeah, the, and so, I mean, uh, you, you, you hit on exactly what one of the conundrums is because if there's an event that's 30 times more likely than it used to be, then the proper question would be to say, well, why haven't we seen an increase of 30 times over the last you know, 50 years or whatever the data set happens to be? Um, it's a little bit like saying, you know, my, my deck of cards, I've put in a whole bunch more aces. So it's, it's, it's 30 times more likely you're gonna get a blackjack. Well, you know, if you don't see 30 times more blackjacks, you might question whether, you know, those <laughs> cards were put in there properly. So let's just go back for a second to Stuart Kirk's presentation, because one of the charts that he showed was about um, deaths per million from all of the kind of climate weather causes. So deaths from floods, droughts, storms, wildfire, and extreme temperatures. And he showed a chart where it dropped from about 250 per million population per year to just visually from his chart, it looks like almost zero. Uh, presumably there's a bit of population, a lot of population growth, but it, but it looks like deaths from those causes have been going down, not up, which you might think from the news coverage around uh, climate damages. So is Stuart Kirk right that we actually have got fewer deaths from all those causes or, or is he wrong? Yeah, Stuart Kirk is, is absolutely right on this point. Um, from about 100 years ago to today, uh, the, the, the total number of deaths have decreased and also the proportion of deaths as a, as a proportion of the population um, by several, two, three orders of magnitude. Um, and this is one of the great science technology policy success stories that we rarely hear about. Um, and, but at the same time, this is what makes it so difficult to attribute climate change signal to uh, human impacts. Because at the same time that the climate is changing, and yes, it is changing, but so too is society, and so too is our ability to deal with the, the, the vagaries of weather. So it's, um, it's exceedingly difficult to say, well, this person died because of climate change, or that person died, um, as deaths have declined by, by orders of magnitude. So, so that's, that's, a, that's a great success story, and it helps to illustrate that you know, if we care about impacts, then there's more than just climate change going on. There's also societal change. Right. And now that can also reverse. I mean, those who are very concerned about climate would say, well, that's all very well, but we may be about to go into some point and we're going to talk about scenarios in the future uh, in, in, a, in a minute. But I want to just um, play you a clip, if I might. Um, and um, this is Professor Michael Mann. I'm sure you know by reputation, possibly even personally. And he came on uh, a show called Democracy Now! in December uh, last year. And there had been some tornadoes and they had tragically killed a number of people in America. And he came on the show and he linked this very strongly to climate change. And let's listen to what he says. If you look at the, the total impact of climate change around the world, um, wildfires, droughts, floods, heat waves, coastal inundation, um, climate change is already costing far more lives than COVID-19. It is deadlier. So Roger, when you hear that, what do you think? 
Well, I think, you know, Professor Mann um, probably needs to brush up on his uh, disaster statistics and, and maybe stick to physical science. Um, if you look at the excess deaths that have been calculated based on COVID over, um, you know, uh, over two of the past two years, um, in a round number, it's an incredible number, something like 10 million people per year. If you take a look at official data on people who have lost their lives in those various extreme events that you've described, um, it's about 5,000 per year uh, in a round number. Still too many, um, every, every person matters, but to try to assert that uh, climate change through these four or five extreme events um, exceeds the number of deaths versus COVID, um, it's just simply irresponsible. It's wrong. And it illustrates one of the challenges of this area is that, uh, you know, if I say something that's accurate, repeated out of the IPCC, as you said, there'll be a whole, you know, swarm of people on Twitter to, to, to correct what's <laughs> supposedly correct, what is correct information. Um, and if someone like Michael Mann says something that's obviously false, it gets, you know, it gets a free pass out there. So this is one reason why a nuanced discussion of climate change is so difficult, is because misinformation is allowed to persist uncorrected. Roger, let me just come back at you for a second, because you've used a figure of 5,000 annual deaths from these climate slash weather related disasters. I came up with a figure, a decadal average of 20,000, I think it's 18 or 19,000, under 20,000. Um, is there a reason for that delta? So the data that everyone relies on for, for deaths from natural disasters comes from a group in Belgium called CRED. They have a data set called the MDAT data set. Um, and there's some, you know, some questions you would raise about what, what data to use over what time period. Do you include earthquake or geophysical deaths? Um, a, a fair number over the last decade would be 10,000, you know, plus or minus. Um, 5,000 is, is closer to what's happened in the last three or four years, which have been exceptionally low, which is very good news. Uh, earlier in the decade, there were larger loss of life. Um, all that is to say that the, the adding up of deaths related to natural disasters is a very imprecise science. Um, so I, I'm not going to quibble with a number of 20,000 over the last decade or you know, 5,000 over the last, on average, over the last few years. Um, over the long term, what is clear is that the reduction is so sufficiently large uh, that a few, unfortunately, a, you know, a few thousand here and there in the recent years doesn't detract from that incredible decline of millions of deaths uh, over the better part of a century. Right. So we're talking about 95 percent plus declines over the last century. So it's a, a very clear Absolutely. signal either way. And it, and it may be larger than that because, uh, as you might guess, in the 1920s, the world wasn't so great in calculating, uh, estimating deaths from, from natural disasters. So, um, but when we get order of magnitude changes, uh, those are very easy to see. Okay, so let's move on from this somewhat morbid discussion and get back to where we were. Okay, so now let's come back to hurricanes and to your own story because you were hired to write about um, climate and to, to be very statistically based um, by an outlook. This is Nate Silver, it's 538, and his brand is all about being data-based and you joined to write about it. And you wrote, I'm, I'm assuming that what you wrote was essentially the story of hurricanes that you've just told us, is that correct? And what happened? Yeah, so this was, this was a while ago, this was 2014. Um, I had been in conversation with Nate. He interviewed me for his book on some of my research that I've done. He asked me to come on. Um, I made a deal with him. I said, I'll write about climate stuff if you let me write about sports stuff. Um, and so he asked me for my first piece to write a piece summarizing the, what was then uh, the recent report of the IPCC, um, the so-called SREX report, Special Report on Extreme Events. Um, I resisted at first saying, you know, I, I've testified before Congress on this. I've written on this for the last you know, 15 years plus. Um, you really want me to write about it again? And the answer was yes. So I wrote a, a, a piece, which is, still is a really good piece, and you know, thanks to their editors, um, that said that the, the overwhelming reason for increasing disaster losses um, is not changes in extreme events, it's changes in society, where we build, um, straight out of the IPCC. Um, I made the, the additional obvious point that the richer a country it is, um, the, the better prepared it will be to withstand the effects of, of natural disasters. Um, that led to an early Twitter mob outrage. Um, the whole world fell in. Um, 
and I didn't last very long at 538. The editorial staff there gave in pretty quickly. So I said that you'd been called an irresponsible skeptic. That was Paul Krugman, no less than Paul Krugman. Um, you had uh, a, a, a sort of, you, you suddenly got your own page on some of these um, uh, blogs that, that try and, you know, sort of maintain message unity on the climate uh, uh, narrative. And then John Holdren, who at the time was the president's scientific advisor, he said that you were outside the scientific mainstream, which was sort of strange if everything that you said was in the IPCC, was based on IPCC and the associated peer reviewed studies. What did that sort of feel like? What, uh, you know, you, you said that you had to leave 538, but what does it feel like to be told by somebody so prominent and senior that you're outside the mainstream, that you're some kind of gadfly? Yeah, yeah. Well, if it was just if it was just John, you know, saying that in passing conversation, or even you know, putting it out on the internet at the time, you know, that's that's fine. People people call each other names. But what happened was I had testified before uh, the U.S. Senate um, just a, a few months before John Holdren did, and my testimony, for whatever reason, I don't know, congressional testimony goes viral, but it received four hundred thousand views on YouTube. It was spread all over the place. All I was doing was summarizing the IPCC. So a few months later, John Holdren's testifying before the same committee, the same senators, and he starts making claims about increasing extreme events. And one of the senators said, hold on, hold on a second, uh, Dr. Holdren. We had a witness in here just a couple of months ago um, who summarized the IPCC, and that contradicts what you're saying. And Holdren, I think Holdren panicked because he said, well, well, that, that guy's outside. He didn't address the issue. That guy's outside the mainstream. Holdren went back to the White House and within a couple of days posted up a six page, it was, it was kind of a screed you might get from your angry uncle, but a, a screed on and posted it on the White House website. And so I am the, I think the, the first and only scientist who's been attacked by the US presidential science advisor um, in the history of the position. Um, and so that in itself was much more significant um, and you know, within a year, I was under investigation by the U.S. Congress. Um, so you had, which, uh, yeah. So Representative Raúl Grijalva, I'm not sure if that's pronounced that right, um, actually asked uh, for an investigation and um, sort of insinuating that you were funded by fossil fuel companies. That is that the thrust of it? Yeah. The the, the accusation was that I was taking secret money under the table um, for my testimony, and so contacted my university and uh, asked that I be investigated. They asked, you know, I had to turn over emails and uh, financial records. And, you know, of course I haven't received any money from fossil fuel companies. Uh, my Ferrari, you know, it says Exxon on the license plate, but you know, don't, don't, don't pay that any attention. Um, no, so Roger, I'm gonna have I'm gonna to just say, don't joke because you know, that'll be taken out of context and it'll be all <laughs> over Twitter and uh, we'll both be in trouble. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, I'm not, I mean, it's 2022 and I'm older and wiser, but I have to say that, you know, being attacked by the White House, being attacked by, you know, a member of Congress, being investigated by my university, um, you know, that was a dark, difficult time. Um, but it also told me, you know, who my friends are, who supports me, who doesn't. Um, and, you know, it, it really altered the course of my career and my life. And, you know, with, with the advantage of hindsight, you know, made the best out of it and it's probably for the best but um but boy i would not wish wish a congressional investigation on on any of it on anyone um it's, it's just no fun which raises an interesting question because you actually said in your blog on stuart kirk you said um that you have some sympathy for him does that mean you also have some sympathy for michael mann because some people say he make, takes these extreme positions because he has been so hounded and investigated and he's so harassed and therefore it's kind of justifies his behavior. Do you have sympathy for him? Absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, one of the good things about being a kind of a public figure and, and having your career out in public is there's a paper trail. And I mean, people can go on my old blog um, when, when Representative Joe Barton was coming after Michael Mann, when, when the Virginia Attorney General Ken Cuccinelli was coming after Michael Mann, I was one of his most outspoken um, and strongest defenders. And in fact, he cited me in his defense. Um, you know, I, I may disagree with some of the things that, that Mann has said and some of his approaches, but boy, the minute that a member of Congress or an attorney general of a U.S. state um, starts investigating him, 
you know, I'm on his side because, you know, we're both professors and we both have tenure and we have a right to call things like we see them. Um, so yeah, I had a lot of sympathy for man and, um, you know, and, and I'm proud to have been publicly defending him. So Roger, thank you very much for that very clear statement of support for Professor Michael Mann, fellow academic who has been harassed, hounded, and even unfairly investigated. Now, we're reaching the point that I promised the audience we would have a natural break. So Roger, please don't go anywhere, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gilardini Foundation. So welcome back, everybody. I hope that you've enjoyed the break in this longer than average episode. In the first part, we were talking about specific climate impacts, hurricanes and others. Now we're going to turn to concerns that Roger has raised about climate science in general. Roger, you recently wrote a paper with Justin Ritchie entitled Distorting the View of Our Climate Future, the Misuse and Abuse of Climate Pathways and Scenarios. And you made some really pretty major, pretty substantial and brutal claims. You said that climate science research and assessments under the umbrella of the IPCC have misused scenarios for more than a decade. Symptoms of misuse have included the treatment of an unrealistic extreme scenario as the world's most likely future in the absence of climate policy and the illogical comparison of climate projections across inconsistent global development trajectories. Now, frequent listeners to Cleaning Up will probably know exactly where this is going, because I have invaded against this scenario RCP 8.5 um, in the most recent IPCC assessment report six. It's been replaced with an equivalent scenario called SSP 5 8.5. And I've talked about it quite frequently on these shows. I consider it to be wildly implausible. Uh, I had a Twitter hashtag called RCP 8.5 is bollocks, and frequent listeners will know about that. But for those that don't, could you just give us a quick refresher on what is RCP 8.5? Yeah, so, so in order to project different futures, recognizing that we can't predict how the future is going to evolve, you know, going back since the start, going back 30 years, the IPCC has used uh, an approach to looking into the future called a scenario analysis. And scenario analysis um, dates to the 1960s um, to RAND Corporation. Scenario analysis was developed by Shell Oil. Um, it's, it's a well-established approach and is extremely useful. Um, long story short, um, there's been a debate within the IPCC family um, whether scenarios are meant to illustrate plausible futures or whether we're supposed to identify the most likely future. Um, and at some point, and this is where IPCC, in my view, um, got things off track. Um, the most extreme scenario of its little scenario set, um, goes by the name RCP 8.5, um, was identified as the single soul, what's called a reference scenario. A reference scenario is, in plain English, this is where we think we're headed. This is the baseline on which we're going to evaluate policy, evaluate impacts, um, and project the future. Um, and it turns out that that scenario um, over eggs the pudding. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 there's too much. It's, um, it's not a plausible scenario anymore. So let me just say one thing. The, the, science is difficult. Science is complicated. Every one of us who engages in research, we make mistakes. We go down blind alleys. We go to, we go to dead ends. We produce papers that are wrong. Being wrong about something isn't a problem in science. The problem is what do you do when you find out that you're going to, in the wrong direction? Do you stick to your guns and you say, you know what, we're gonna keep going headstrong. Do you attack the people who are criticizing you? For the climate community, the issue isn't so much that it developed and followed RCP 8.5. We could debate and discuss that. But the issue is that now for many years, um, that has been known by many people in the community. And yet in the most recent IPCC report, that scenario features more than any other. So for me, yes, that is a signal that there are some uh, self-correction issues in the scientific community. And one way to call attention to that is to write articles that call it out, um, even if they're unpopular um, among some in the community. And that's what we did. Right, and 
in terms of RCP 8.5, and it's got a successor scenario uh, in the most recent um, assessment report, which is uh, SSP 5 8.5, but it's all talking about 8.5 watts per square meter of forcing by 2100. And just for the audience that doesn't follow this in as much detail, to get there, you have to burn a lot of coal. I mean, we're talking about something like seven to 10 times as much coal as currently um, in a world where coal use has actually peaked something just under a decade ago. And so this is why it's come up in a number of these conversations, um, because it's not just slightly implausible, it is by now wildly implausible. And in fact, there's a paper in 2017, which I think has not received nearly enough attention. And this is, again, it's Justin Ritchie and um, a co-researcher um, called Daulat Abadi, and they produced a paper in 2017 that essentially um, questioned how much coal there is that can be extracted and burnt. And is there even enough um, to get to that scenario? Yeah, I mean, let me just say all credit to Justin um, and Hadi for their work. Um, Justin is a genius. Um, I mean, there's, there's a few points in a long academic career when you remember the first time you read a paper and how it altered your thinking. And I remember in 2017, um, reading his paper about, um, about high coal futures and are they still plausible? And you know, light bulbs going off in my head. And by February of 2018, I was giving a talk on it in Japan um, in front of Yoichi Kaya. Um, it, this should have been a fundamentally pathbreaking paper that caused some introspection in the climate science community. Um, instead, I, I think I just looked this up yesterday. His paper has been cited 55 times in five years which is, in my view, a sad statement on the community. His, his work has been largely ignored. Now, I've been lucky. Um, I've gotten to know Justin and I've collaborated with him now on, I don't know, three, four, five papers since then. Um, but the, the notion that implausible scenarios sit at the center of um, a lot of climate research, um, that, that information was available to all of us uh, in 2017. And so my issue isn't so much, you know, did we originally get scenarios wrong, but what do we do when it's pointed out in legitimate peer reviewed solid research um, that they're out of date? Do we quickly update them or do we, do we hold fast? And unfortunately, um, we're holding fast. And I had this infuriating experience talking to Nico Bauer from the Potsdam Institute on another podcast where I challenged this kind of, you know, seven to 10 X dash for coal, which includes coal to liquids, right? Yeah. And the thesis being, well, if you're gonna have a wealthy world, you're gonna keep traveling, transporting things. And if the oil runs out and the gas runs out because by 2100, it will have peaked, then the only thing you can use, if you don't believe, because you haven't figured, you haven't got the numbers on how renewable energy is getting cheaper and batteries are getting cheaper. So electrification of transport is not a thing. Right. You believe in coal to liquids. And I had this huge discussion with him where I said, nobody in my world, the energy world is planning or thinking about or would consider or conceive of a return to coal to liquids. And yet that was what was driving the RCP 8.5 scenarios. And it was that implausible. And yet, as you say, no course correction. So what scenario are we currently on? If it's not 8.5, where are we currently headed? Yeah, let me just say one thing in response to that um, before we start talking about more plausible scenarios. Um, you know, I've done a lot of thinking and you know, have a lot of experience with, with why, why might it be that the climate, the physical science climate community holds so fast to RCP 8.5? Um, and the answer, it's pretty mundane. It's pretty useful and good for physical science climate research. If you want to see the signal of greenhouse gases in climate model output, then you are much better positioned if you have a scenario with a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. It's not, it's not because of climate politics. It's not because of climate policy. Um, it's because the, the, the needs of climate research are better served by an extreme scenario, even though the needs of policy might be served by a much more plausible scenario. So I do think that this is an issue that involves a lot more um, kind of down in the weeds, sciencey type politics, not so much the, the hot politics of climate change. Um, 
now you ask, you know, what, what's a more plausible scenario? Um, people may be surprised to learn in the IPCC community and in the science community to be larger, there is no one who is tasked with the responsibility for assessing scenario plausibility. If you go to the IPCC reports all the way back to the beginning, the number one criterion that it applies for inclusion of scenarios in its report is plausibility. And so if you ask an IPCC author, what's plausibility actually mean in practice? No one knows because that's not been a priority. So I can just tell you quickly about some of the recent research we've done. Um, we took um, 1,311 scenarios that we can find in the IPCC scenario database. And we asked a simple question of this big set of scenarios, which ones best matched uh, two criterion. One is how carbon dioxide emissions have evolved from 2005 to 2020, and which ones best match the projections of the International Energy Agency, which does short-term scenarios from 2020 to 2040 or 2050, and come up with, a, I think our result was 177 scenarios survived that, that test of, um, of comparison to reality and the short-term predictions. The next thing to do is say, well, what do those 177 scenarios say about the long-term future? All right, if we call those the plausible scenarios, what do they say? Um, if you take a look at just the, the fifth assessment report scenario database, um, the, the median value of one of those 177 scenarios is 2.2 degrees Celsius. Um, for, for people who are technically inclined, it's a, it's a 3.4 watts per meter squared scenario in 2100. Um, 2.2 degrees is not two degrees. It's not the Paris target. It's not close to 1.5 degrees, um, but nor is it four or five degrees that you would find in the very extreme scenarios. So what we concluded in our paper, which was just published a couple months ago, is that in actuality, um, deep decarbonization is an enormous challenge, but the world in 2022 is much better positioned for that challenge than we probably would have thought or certainly would have thought in 2005. Um, and so, you know, it's good news, but it's qualified good news. Um, it means that um, we're not fighting against the building of 30,000 new coal-fired power, coal -fired power plants. I mean, we still have 6,000 on the planet, we have to retire, um, but the challenge is significantly different than uh, we might've thought it was once. I just wanna go back to your, your point about nobody is assessing plausibility. And so you, you use this methodology and you said, 2.2 degrees and effectively the equivalent of an RCP 3.4 would be plausible. Um, but I just wanted to highlight actually, because we had um, Inga Anderson, who's the head of UNEP and the IPCC reports to UNEP, it's part of UNEP. And I had her on the show episode 77. And I actually asked her why the question that you'd like an answer to, or you suppose that it's because it's convenient for research. And I asked her, why does the IPCC continue to center its research as it does unequivocally on RCP 8.5? And her response was, as you know, because you look into this in great detail, the percentage likelihood of the scenarios are provided. And I pushed her on this. I said, I'm sorry, Inga, I need to come in. There are no percentage likelihoods between the different RCPs or SSPs. And she, she reiterated, reiterated the point. Um, which is extraordinary to me that the head of the UNEP does not know that the IPCC does not say that RCP 8.5 is extremely implausible and that something else is plausible with percentages. It doesn't. It really doesn't. It has gone some way to hinting that RCP 4.5 is more in line with things like the IEA and the track so far. Um, and in fact, just before COP, there was an update on the NDCs, the Nationally Determined Contributions, um, and that's out there. And it doesn't, it's very interesting because it includes a chart which includes RCP 4.5 and shows tracking, but it actually excludes RCP 8.5. And it's never, no one at the IPCC has ever said, we should really stop using this completely because it's not plausible, have they? Yeah, I mean, it's, I have some mixed views on this. I mean, so for a lot of people, um, you know, I've been working on scenarios, you know, off and on since, you know, 2007. Um, if, if anyone, including an expert, is not familiar with the details of scenarios and how they evolve, I, complete forgiveness. I mean, it is, it is mind-bogglingly complex. 
Um, it is, I, I gave a talk yesterday. I could not even give the history of scenarios in an hour. Um, so, so if people don't really understand how they've been used, how that's changed, I get it. Um, it's, it's, really, it's really challenging. Um, at the same time, the scenarios are so important and they're so central to everything we talk about in climate science impacts and policy that, that someone needs to have that responsibility. Um, and, and unfortunately, that doesn't happen. So the IPCC, you know, the recent six assessment gave some really mixed messages. So it said up front, um, in I think one of the early chapters, it said that the RCP 8.5 and its, its correlates um, are, are low likelihood. And the world is more likely on a track consistent with a 4.5 watts per meter. Um, didn't follow that up in the report. And, I, and again, I get that also, because if you have, you know, since the last IPCC, probably 15 to 20,000 peer reviewed papers that use RCP 8.5 is the IPCC really going to say, we're going to ignore all that research that's been funded and done and is on people's CVs? Um, this, to me, this speaks to a, the need for a brand new way to do assessments. We cannot develop scenarios in 2005 and still be using them 17 years later. Um, we need a, a much more rapid turnaround. We need to be able to do science that is on a more of a policy relevant timescale. So I broke energy Twitter or climate Twitter at one point by saying those papers, not the ones that use RCP 8.5 to kind of give something a right. big kick and see what happens, but the ones that position it or call it business as usual. And when I say position it, you know, if they say the damages are going to be this unless we take action and then there'll be that. And if, the, if, the, if this is what the damage, even if they don't call it business as usual. Um, but I called for those papers to be essentially withdrawn and then either resubmitted after correction or simply withdrawn because they are, I mean, I, it's very hard to know what to call them other than junk science. Yeah, you know, the, the scientific, you know, the body of scientific research is full of papers that are obsolete or no longer relevant or had bad data. I mean, I don't think that's a problem and, you know, the effort to withdraw or correct them is probably not worth the time and effort, but in using them, in understanding them, we're smart. We know, we know today that those are implausible scenarios. I mean, I think one of the issues that, that, that boggles my mind all the time is there are, there are thousands of studies that use RCP 8.5 either as a business as usual, or they might call it a high emissions, but the implication is this is the trajectory we're on. And the scenario that's used for quote unquote policy success is RCP 4.5. And they're paired up um, improperly. Um, one as a, as a baseline and one as a policy scenario. If, if people knew that RCP 4.5 was considered in large parts of the literature policy success, and today much of the literature looks at RCP 4.5 as an upper bound based on current policies, try explaining that one to a policymaker, right? That, that what you thought was success today is the worst case scenario. It's, 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 it's a challenge, I think, for the for the scenarios in the climate research right. community. And, and let's give an example of that, because I have tried to explain it to policymakers, and it's very hard. The U.S. National Climate Assessment 2018 um, actually does exactly this. I mean, it's it's buried on page 1,358, but it shows damages from RCP 8.5, damages from RCP 4.5, and says this is the benefit we get if we take action, right? And one scenario has got a population of 12.7 billion or 12 billion, and the other one has got a population of 8.7 billion, and they subtract one from the other and say, this is what we'll save if we take action on climate. And I'm assuming they don't mean population control. I'm assuming they mean shutting down coal-fired power stations. It is completely, an, you called an improper comparison. And then it's, of course, even more improper when you say that we are already on track for 4.5 and actually what we're fighting for and what gets me out of bed every day is to try to get to 2.6 or 1.9 or some much better scenario closer to you know well, very orthodox well under two degrees and as close as possible to 1.5 degrees paris agreement targets but that national climate assessment is regarded and is communicated you know you and i can point it out with our little bandwidth <coughs> sheer weight of communicators saying that there is this huge benefit to climate action 
And then it gets amplified, not just in the documents, but that got into the New York Times and CNN, did it not? Yeah, I mean, so this is this is a good example. Um, and this, this is something else that gets me in trouble. Um, scenarios are great for exploring the future if you want to hit a climate model to see what happens to generate hypotheses. Um, but at this point in the climate debate, um, I often think that these scenarios get in the way more than they help. Um, if I was, you know, if I, if I was in charge, I would say, you know what, forget about these uh, for policy purposes, forget about these scenarios. We want to get to net zero CO2 by a certain date. So, you know, if that's 2050, if that's 2070, let's pick that date and let's start talking about policies that get us to net zero rather than hiding all the assumptions and projections behind these different scenarios, as you say, with different GDP, different population growth and so on. The reality is we're, we're here where we are today and we can have some certainty about what the world looks like today. We want to retire all that coal, we want to retire all that natural gas and all that oil. Um, that's, that, those are the scenarios that we should be looking at. Um, and this gets back to my book, The Climate Fix. At the time I proposed, we looked at, at rates of decarbonization. Um, which is the, you know, the decrease in carbon dioxide emissions per unit of GDP. Um, I've since realized that even that's too technical. Um, so, you know, let's just look at exajoules of fossil fuel energy and set targets and start discussing, debating, and measuring how we're doing on that target. Um, temperature targets are fine, um, but, you know, most people don't know what they mean, and they certainly don't know, know how they translate into how our energy infrastructure must change over the next 50 years. Right, so I'm, I'm smiling because I'm trying to avoid a rabbit hole because when you talk about exajoules of fossil energy, of course, there's a factor of three between uh, primary energy, which is what ge generally gets measured in exajoules mm -hmm. and what the economy really needs, which is actually the challenge is really about one third of what a lot of people think it is. So when you get people like Bjorn Lomborg showing how impossible it is, they're generally just got the wrong end of the stick. Uh, but I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. I want to ask, um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, th that's the subject for another podcast, and, and I hope to do that one. Um, I want to ask then, how do you respond to something like, um, there's a paper, Schwalm, Glendon and Duffy, RCP 8.5 tracks cumulative CO2 emissions. I mean, this is a scientific paper. It's a peer-reviewed paper. It gets published. Um, it was in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, August 2020, right? Couldn't get much more prominent than that. And it says, we're on track for RCP 8.5. And then it gets picked up and it's used as the basis of a major publication by McKinsey. First of all, was there any merit to that publication? And what are the impacts of that being used by a company like McKinsey? Yeah, so there's a few things to say about the Schwalm paper. Um, none of them particularly generous. Um, what they did in their methodology is they didn't actually rescue RCP 8.5. What they did is they said, well, if we take RCP 8.5 and we acknowledge that it has incorrect assumptions about coal energy going forward, and we strip out its land use assumptions uh, and put in equally incorrect land use assumptions. So they would, IPCC projects that land use um, emissions will be generally declining throughout the century. What they said instead was, well, let's assume that they rapidly increase. Nobody's saying that, but that's what they said. And we invent a new scenario, then under those circumstances, maybe RCP is so wrong that it's right because its errors all cancel out. Um, you know, ironically enough, uh, the Global Carbon Project, um, the very next year, published a dramatic revision to land use <laughs> estimates that, that revised them down. So, so that, um, technically, that, that study has some problems. There's a further problem. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's inconvenient and it's unfortunate to raise this, but that study was funded by McKinsey, um, and McKinsey... Uh, was not acknowledged, and then McKinsey was the main uh, organization promoting it uh, because they have a number of reports promoting RCP 8.5. So the whole situation is just not a good moment for science. Um, I don't, I mean, that study is often cited to kind of rescue RCP 8.5, um, but I haven't met very many analysts um, or researchers who think that the assumptions in it are particularly plausible. 
So we see this in research a lot where a study is produced in order to fill a need for a citation. Um, and in this case, to counter um, work by Glenn Peters and Zeke Housefather, uh, which got a lot of attention. Um, and they had their exchange in PNAS and people can read that if they want to. Um, but I think that the consensus in you know, IPCC sort of tipped its hat to this. The consensus is that RCP 8.5 is not rescuable at this point. Right, and since we're doing a sort of tour of major papers, both you know some of the good and some of the bad, and you've brought up House, House Father and Peters, um, and they are you know very much on the side of the kind of the clear and the good here because uh, the Nature Commentary 2019 they wrote something called "Business as U the Business as Usual Story is Misleading," uh, and that was really to my mind when sort of my hashtag. Uh, RCP 85 is bollocks could have got its first outing in some ways and uh, right. Glenn was very generous when I had him on the show and said that yeah my hashtag sort of prompted him and uh, and Zeke Housefather to write that piece. Yeah I mean Glenn and Zeke are, are two super smart guys too super thoughtful and also uh, super approachable and, and engageable on social media and I have a lot of respect um, for their paper. Um, probably the most important thing wasn't what they said because it had been said before by Justin Ritchie um, numerous times, but where they said it. Yeah. Um, once the Nature editorial board decides to uh, commission a, a piece like that, um, that's a signal that you know this has gone mainstream. Um, and I know you know the the, the 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 Twitter discussions that you motivated through your hashtag and persistence, um, and the efforts of a number of people helped to you know elevate that issue. But I mean, honestly. It was only yesterday I tweeted out two papers with, uh, you know, RCP 8.5 as BAU. Um, it's it's the issue. It persists even though there is a um, a wave of support within the community for understanding that that scenario um, is a bit dodgy right. when used in policy context. Right, and in fact, there's still a scenario called SSP 3 8.5 being used in papers and. The, not even the modelers in the most tortured modeling runs can even produce that scenario. But if you want a really big result, you go with a huge population from SSP3 and you go with the heating from, S from the 8.5 scenario, and then you mash them up and you get, you get lots of it, whether you're in uh, malaria or whatever it is that you're worrying about, you get this fabulous result. It's a complete, it, but it's, it's scientific nonsense. Yeah, it's unfortunate. And, um, you know, as, as you say, SSB 3-8.5 doesn't exist in the scenario world, but it exists in some of the impacts world. Um, it's actually an important scenario that's being used in the U.S. government's regulations um, uh, employing the social cost of carbon. So, so these are not, um, you know, trivial scientific issues that, that eggheads debate. These have real world consequences. Um, and, you know, I, if, you know let's, let's be clear, because they have real world consequences, that's one reason why it's hard to get them corrected, because uh, there is a sort of a intellectual lock in between policy, politics and science. I want to come back to that and talk about some of the impacts, why it matters uh, in terms of resource allocation, central bank stress tests and so on in a minute. But before we do that, there's one other paper that I want to highlight. Again, it's in Nature, November 2021. Um, and um, the the headline is top climate scientists are skeptical that nations will rein in global warming. And the results were over 60% thought that the world will warm over three degrees by 2100, right? You've already said plausible is 2.2, 2.4, it's that sort of range. 60% um, of climate scientists think it'll be more than three degrees by 2100. 61% experience anxiety, grief, or distress, and 66% engage in advocacy related to climate change. Now, to me, the issue here is what do you call a climate scientist? Because the IPCC has these different working groups, and somebody who is an expert on mosquitoes moving north, or ice melting, or flooding, some of the things we've talked about, hurricanes, may not know enough, probably doesn't know enough about the energy system to judge which scenarios are plausible or implausible in the absence, complete absence of, of guidance on, on which ones are plausible. 
Yeah, I mean, you you can put me down with Vaclav Schmiel on this one. Um, even experts in energy systems, you know, going back 50 years, are, are not great prognosticators of where the energy systems are going. Um, our, our track record at prediction of the future, um, and something as complicated as, you know, the rest of the century and decarbonization, which involves politics, geopolitics, war, technology, um, I don't put a lot of weight. That, I mean, that's why scenario analysis is important. We want to come up with policies that are robust to whatever happens in the future, wars with Ukraine or technological developments or um, you know, sh rapid shifts in climate. Um, so, so I don't put a lot of weight into long-term speculative predictions uh, because historically, none of us, not me, not you, nobody's good at that. I mean, in, in, if we were good at it, you know, we'd probably be sitting on a beach somewhere um, with a big bank account. We, we can't anticipate the future. Okay, you can't answer it, and I would agree. I mean, prediction is hard, particularly about the future. And, right. You know, for, but but the issue here for me is this article gets um, rolled out very frequently yep. as a way of saying, you know, Michael, and I suspect also Roger, you're wrong. Yep. It's much scarier than you're portraying because 60% um, of climate scientists say that we're headed for three degrees and et cetera, et cetera. Why would they be so concerned? And of course, my you know, my response to that is, and I've looked at some of the people who answered that questionnaire, is there may be climate scientists in the impacts, uh, vulnerabilities, uh, uh, et cetera, all the geophysics of how the planet works, but they are not expert at all in the one thing that would tell them whether they should be that worried or not. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a, I mean, what you raise is a much deeper issue in how we think about climate change. I mean, if you think about the structure of the IPCC, you know, the, the, the one that gets number one, and usually number one is at the top of the table, is the physical science working group. If you actually understand how the IPCC works, you will quickly realize that all of the action starts with working group three. That's what provides the information that ultimately drives the climate models. It has always been that way. Um, so, so yes, there is a privilege that we have. We see this in COVID and public health um, that you know, we, we, we privilege the expertise of people with uh, virology backgrounds or infectious disease. Um, but whether people wear masks or they socially distance or you know, whatever, it's a lot more to do with sociology and politics than it does uh, you know, biology uh, or medical science. So, so these are deeper issues in what sort of expertise is privileged in these discussions. Um, at some point, I have to think that the, the disparity between the physical sciences expertise in climate and the energy systems expertise um, it has to spill out into the open because there is, an, as you say, an increasing gap between the views of those two communities. Right. And now, at this point in time, central banks and stress tests are kind of the, the leading edge, the bleeding edge of this discussion, um, because central banks, and this was raised by Stuart Kirk in his presentation, are throwing scenarios at the financial system. And Stuart Kirk talked about how these scenarios buried in the small print there are these huge shocks. He yeah. raised the issue of interest rate shocks. Um, interestingly, Stuart Kirk didn't raise the question of whether the scenarios were plausible at all. So he just said, Miami will be six meters underwater uh, and it doesn't matter. Right. Whereas I think where we've been going is, well, hang on a second, actually it's not going to be. But what are the central banks assuming in their scenarios? So the, the, in, their stress, it, it, sorry, in, in their stress tests. Yeah. So, well, the stress tests used by central banks um, are themselves a function of a number of scenarios um, that are used to drive them. And uh, it, this gets down another rabbit hole. There's an entire industry and sub-industry of consultants and contractors, unfortunately, including some of the same institutions that provide scenarios for the IPCC, who are funded to produce scenarios um, to drive these stress tests. And if you take a look at these scenarios, you actually take a deep dive in the rabbit hole, you will find that many of these scenarios uh, don't pass tests of plausibility. Um, and it's, you know, there's the, the network for greening the financial system scenarios, where business as usual, um, it was pretty close to 8.5, and they came up with the version 2.0, and now it's more like 6.0 scenarios. Still implausible, I would argue. Um, so if, if the point is to um, generate stress tests for plausible worst case scenarios, someone has to have the task. Um, and it has to be someone independent, someone who doesn't have a, a stake in the game, 
who can come up with criteria of plausibility. What does that actually mean? How would you know it when you see it? Um, right now, that's either black boxed or, or no one's doing it. And so uh, for me, stress testing itself creates risks for the financial system. Um, and I think Stuart Kirk was right. In one sense, he went too far, right? With his flippant comments and talking about things. In another sense, he didn't go far enough because he completely missed out on the extreme scenarios, implausible scenarios um, that, are, that you know, would have been a stronger part of his message. So I had uh, the privilege of having Mark Carney yeah. um, on this show. And uh, he talked about the you know, G fans, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, but also the network for greening of the financial system, which is yeah. the network of uh, central banks. So if you had a few minutes with him, what would you tell him about this, particularly about those stress tests? What would you recommend that he did? What would you want him to know? So it's, it's interesting. One of the things, I mean, I'm not sure I could tell Mark Kearney anything that would be of importance. This, this issue is so characterized by interlapping um, conflicts of interest. So, you know, Mark Kearney, one of his hats is he's a principal in uh, a company that invests in renewable energy projects around the world. Another hat is he helps to oversee stress, uh, you know, the basis for stress testing among central banks um, that invest in, in projects that his company benefits from. So, so and then on the other hand, the same, uh, the same scenario developers um, also provide scenarios for the IPCC, which then get fed back into uh, governmental decision making. So, so the, 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 the issue here is if this was the fossil fuel industry, people would be going nuts, right? Because there's all these interlocking. If, if you learn that Exxon was in charge of funding a side project for IPCC scenarios, you know, one or both eyebrows would, would go up pretty high. So, you know, for me, the issue is that we have to um, ensure that whatever we do with stress testing and information, it's all conducted with scientific integrity. And that means just following basic principles of conflict of interest, of independence, uh, of transparency. Um, plausibility should be a, a front and center as an issue of transparency. Everyone should be able to see what the criteria of transparency are for the selection of scenarios by the Bank of England, say. Um, you have to dig through you know, dozens of reports even to understand where the scenarios are. There's not a lot of transparency here. So, you know, again, I don't know if I ever would have an audience with these folks, and I don't think they would be amenable to this, but this is one where, where governments in particular have to be sensitive um, to the fact that they, they're creating a new infrastructure of institutions, um, and those institutions should follow basic principles of, of you know, democratic governance, and I don't think they are right now. Okay, so you wrote this paper with Justin Ritchie saying the climate science community is misusing scenarios and you it's a long paper and you've got lots of examples which you know are, are, are pretty easy to kind of verify. Yeah. Um, and you, you kind of you provide some recommendations, which are along the lines of what you've just said good scientific principles and uh, and transparency and so on so on so on. What was the response from the climate science community? Did they kind of go, hmm, you make some good points. Yeah, we need to do that. You're right. Or did they close ranks? You know, I don't think it was really either. I think, um, I mean, it's really interesting. Like my work um, out in public is pretty much ignored by the, the climate science community. Um, some of my work was cited. I mean, I was cited in all three IPCC work groups um, this past year, which, you know, that's great and rewarding. But some of the most, I think, significant work was was not um, paid attention to. Um, I, I have a small group of people, um, I won't name any names lest they get in trouble, that I interact with in the climate science community, fully aware of these issues. Um, but you, you, know, you won't be surprised to learn that uh, many of the leading climate journalists and climate scientists have blocked me on Twitter. I don't exist for, for many of these folks. So, um, I do, I mean, I can look at the downloads and see how many thousands of times our papers are downloaded. They're getting read, um, but very few people actually uh, show up to talk, discuss, debate, or tell us where we're wrong. Um, and, you know, for me, having impact but not recognition, you know, that's fine. That's, that, that's, I'd much rather have it that way than the other way around. Right, right. And what do you say to those people who would say, you know, just keep quiet. 
because climate change is real. And yeah, the impacts might not be happening. You know, there are there are impacts. You've acknowledged that the really bad stuff <coughs> will not hit this decade, next decade, maybe even not this century. And I had Jörn Rockstrom on cleaning up and he talked about how the commitment time, the time when bad stuff could be caused is now, the fuse that we're lighting is now, but the bang might be in hundreds of years. We didn't phrase it like that, but we talked about the commitment time and the impact time in set of commitment time in, cent in decades, impact time in centuries. But you know, the only way we're gonna get action is by raising the alarm. And we should be, if that means exaggerating the science, so be it, message unity is key, and that we should keep quiet. What do you say? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's funny, you're right. I mean, I've, I've, I've had this conversation on and off with colleagues for about 20 years. Um, and, you know, for me, it's, it's, you know, I'm trained as a political scientist. And once you recognize that success in deep decarbonization requires a sustained effort over the better part of a century, um, I, alarm doesn't work. What works is a low level of, of pressure applied continuously. What, one of my mentors once said, if you want to turn around a, a, a battleship, you don't kick it. You lean on it and you, and you have a tugboat and you push it and eventually it gets moving. Um, we need in the scientific community, we need legitimacy and trust um, for many, many decades. I am concerned when I see, you know, in other settings like with COVID, um, how politicized science and science advice can be so quickly. Um, I'm concerned about populist movements. I'm concerned about the loss of support um, in the US at least for universities. Um, the, the, for me, the best way to ensure continued legitimacy and trust is to be open, honest and call things like we see them. And I do differ with some colleagues. I think that if we say, hey, we made a mistake here with RCP 8.5, we're going to fix it. That doesn't reduce trust, that increases trust. Um, and I think there's you know, an ample empirical evidence of what builds and doesn't build trust among the public. So yeah, I, I, I am not a, a big fan of um, ends justifies the means arguments that you know, we need to get action so whatever we say goes. Um, I think that the science is plenty strong enough um, to survive course corrections on climate change. And I, I have little concern um, I think that if, if the scientific community came out and said, hey, guess what? We got good news. RCP 8.5 uh, as a central scenario is off the table. Um, but we got bad news because RCP 4.5 is still on the table. Um, I think the public would, number one, they'd be, you know, that's a positive message. And they say, yeah, I trust those scientists because when things go, you know, they go down the wrong path, they fix it. So it, it is a, an orientation to research and policy that I know not everyone in the community shares. Um, but, you know, at the same time, looking at COVID and working on that topic a lot for the last couple of years, um, the same debates occur there also. And um, it, it's, it's an, it, part of our times at the interface of science and politics. So, Roger, on that note, I think we're going to have to wrap up. It's been a marathon session. Halfway through, we turned it into a two-parter or at least gave people a bit of a nature break. Um, but thank you so much for joining us here. It's been extremely thought provoking and I think a very important discussion. And I would like to think that instead of it being brushed aside as so much of uh, your sort of difficult thought or difficult inputs into this climate debate have been, I would hope that it spurs more discussion. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate the time. I appreciate your preparation and I wish you all the best of luck with the podcast going forward. I'm a fan. Thank you very much. And of course, most importantly, I wish you a fantastic sabbatical when you come over to Europe. I hope you have a good time. Thank you. So that was Roger Pelkey Jr., Professor of Science and Policy at the University of Colorado Boulder. And I thought it was going to be a fascinating and controversial conversation. And indeed, it was. My guest next week is Julia Pike. She's the Director of Finance for Sizewell C. And that's the new nuclear power station being built by EDF. So please join me at this time next week for a conversation with Julia Pike. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Capricorn Investment Group, 